So, uh, my name is Christian Kainek, and I'm teaching uh, recursion for quite a, a number of years. Uh, you, you can uh, guess how many years, because now I'm emeritus, so uh, I'm just retired for the last uh, six months. Um, I also uh, try to, to do um, uh, some MOOC uh, experiments with uh, teaching recursion, and I will talk about uh, that. So, here is a plan, but uh, let's do into the, uh, the content of the talk. So first, we wanted to teach recursion because uh, this is an inter introductory course for uh, young students. Um, the introductory course for young students in informatics, in fact, depends on the kind of the, of the audience you have. And in our case, we just have young students which are dedicated to maths or computer science only. So they are scientific ones, but they want to do maths or computer science. Maybe they don't know exactly whether they will go to maths or computer science, but they are sure of one thing. They don't want to do any more or any longer physics, chemistry, or biology. So the course uh, focuses on the concept and not on the programming language, even if we use one, of course. And the concept is recursion because it's the, I would say, the, the natural following of recurrence, uh, which is taught in, uh, in their younger, uh, youngest years. So we are teaching recursion, and uh, it has some nice properties. So the, the first thing is that it's gender neutral, because recursion is something new for every kind of people, whether they are male or female. And uh, using scheme also levels everything down to the, uh, to, I would say, to the bar metal, because uh, they don't know Scheme. They, they can know Python or Basic, Visual Basic or something, but in front of Scheme, they are all equals. And uh, girls uh, perform much better than boys in, in this course. Uh, the, uh, the last point is that recursion is an intriguing concept, and uh, it, in, it allows, in fact, to introduce young students to computer science as a science, not as a technique that you have to, to learn in order to write some programs. So uh, there are many implications of that choice of teaching recursion. So we owe much to the spirit of ISICP, which is the, uh, the book from uh, Abel Sanderson, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. So we um, uh, use uh, much of the material of that uh, uh, book. We teach uh, recursion, and of course, we have to use a programming language. So we, dis we decide, in fact, to choose Scheme. But we also reduce Scheme to the uh, subset we wanted, in fact, to teach. And we strongly believe that uh, confining the students into the right language we are teaching without any, I would say, further advanced uh, techniques with uh, things that are, which are not taught, and uh, like uh, continuations, macro, and so on, uh, in fact, allows you to avoid any question on, and say, well, teacher, I want to use that feature you do not explain. So you just have to confine the students into the small subset we define. And of course, we wrote the uh, evaluators for that subset only, and we check that the students are in that subset. So we choose Scheme because it has a simple and uniform syntax, only parentheses. It has a very simple grammar where you, where you can compose uh, every kind of expressions. The only um, uh, restriction is that you cannot put definitions everywhere. There are some spe uh, specific places where you can put definitions. And it's functional, so it's more in line with mathematics. Uh, we teach recursion, which is applied both on algorithmics and data, and, uh, data structures. And we finish the course with uh, the explanation of eval, which takes a program and gives the answer. So this is uh, something that we do in nine uh, or ten weeks. So in the, uh, uh, I would say, in the normal setting of amphitheater, uh, it's one and a half course and two to four hours of, uh, of, personal, com of personal work in computer labs uh, per week. And in the MOOC, we are on a scale of nine uh, weeks also. And the uh, personal work is estimated to two to three hours per week. So here is the, uh, uh, the syllabus of the course. So uh, after two weeks of basics, we introduce recursion on natural numbers. Then we skip on list. We skip on binary trees, general trees, 
and then we uh, make the, uh, I would say, the equivalence with uh, symbolic expressions, and we go to the eval function. So this is the plan where we teach recursion, recursion, recursion. Okay, so here is the, dialect, the specific dialect of scheme we are teaching. So we have uh, these uh, special forms, uh, if, define, let, and, and or. Uh, these are uh, short circuit uh, uh, operators. And only on week uh, six, that is uh, after the, the middle of the course, we introduce quote the quotation, which allows you, in fact, to cite a constant. Uh, we have some adjunctions, and we have one... Uh, thing which is the verify uh, special form which allows you in fact to write unit tests and we insist that unit tests are mandatory. Uh, there are some uh, things like uh, there is an implicit let rec so if you want to introduce local mutually recursive functions uh, then you don't have to use let rec because the syntax in fact allows you to express that without let rec but it's a let rec. So we have no lambda uh, every function should be named, and we uh, we made some experiments uh, in uh, around 2000, where uh, we use lambda or we don't use lambda, and we think that students are much more comfortable if they name functions, and uh, they can uh, uh, give as a value the name of a function and get the function itself, uh, rather than using lambda. So we decided to say that every function should be named, even if you can manipulate it as a first-class value. Uh, there is no begin, and uh, the uh, definition of a dialect is only two A4 page long. That is, uh, you can just uh, take it, uh, put it under your pillow, and it will infuse in your brain very <laughs> easily. Uh, so we have some evaluators of, uh, of a dialect, and they only know that dialect. So they refuse anything with uh, uh, weird functions or weird features uh, that exist in scheme but are not in that uh, uh, subset. So here is an example. And uh, you can see that we insist on uh, using some, uh, I would say, uh, structure comment uh, that define the type of a function and what the function is doing. So here you have an example uh, and another one here. Uh, you see that we have a definition here, a top-level definition, and there are two uh, mutually recursive definitions, even if this one is uh, only, I would say, uh, uh, self-recursive. Uh, so this is the, uh, the way we can define a let rec between these two functions, okay? But it's all in the syntax. You don't have to write let rec. And then you have to just uh, uh, give the body of a function map, which is there. Here you see the verify function, which allows you to write unit test. So you want to verify map, and you say that that expression should give that value. So here uh, the expression is evaluated, and here you just have a constant, which is the result of the function. So you cannot use here something that is evaluated. You just write the uh, exact uh, result you are expecting. We refuse to, to have uh, something evaluated here because much uh, students realize after uh, a small time that they can write foo of x gives foo of x, okay, which is quite true, but it's, it's, a, it's a way of cheating, of course. Um, okay, so for, as I said, uh, the function definitions are prefixed by a structure command, and the command should introduce, uh, oops, sorry, uh, should introduce remember how, yes. Uh, two things, uh, hypothesis, uh, uh, hypothesis, no, I don't know how to pronounce it. So hypothesis uh, assumes that the invoker should assume that some properties are true before invoking the function, and errors are uh, checked by the invokee, and uh, you, you have to, deep to, to clearly separate the two. And the unit tests are mandatory, and if you give a, uh, a program to the evaluator that doesn't contain the unit test, then it will be refused. Uh, we have only 40 library functions, so it's quite a, a small language, in fact. We have only, as I have said, uh, six special forms and uh, 40 functions, so it's a small subset. So, so Deckard also has these educational 
languages, restricted languages. Yeah, in Dr. Schimo, Dr. Racket, yes, yeah. we have this thing. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's, yeah. it's the same. We, we, we defined that in 2000, and we, meant, we, we see that Dr. Schimo made the same step. In right. fact. And yeah. we are quite aligned uh, with, uh, with, this, uh, with this ID. Uh, we also introduced uh, some graphical uh, uh, library because uh, students like to design, to draw uh, things. Uh, we also have uh, an interesting fact in the graphical thing because a graphic is a 2D uh, composition. And uh, you can do it, I would say, by the X or by the Y. And uh, this gives the, the, uh, uh, the possibility of, of having more than one solution to a problem. And this is something which is quite new for the students, to have more than one solution. They are used in math to say, well, this is the solution. You just uh, align your equations and, until you get the answer. And we noticed a, uh, around 2000 that when we give to a student the possibility of looking at the solution, they never look at the solution. Because if they succeed in exercise, they have a solution. It is the solution. It cannot, be an, it cannot uh, exist another one. So we decided to put sometimes two solutions for the same problem. And then we, con we, dis we uh, discovered at that time that students said two solutions, and they look at the solution at that time. And graphics with its uh, 2D composition, in fact, implies the fact that they are quite puzzled. And that there are two solutions? Oh, that's weird. And uh, or something also, we, we use uh, substantives instead of verbs for the graphical library. So you compose triangles with rectangles, and you don't have uh, things like a draw triangle, draw rectangle. We, we insist on the fact that all recursion, in fact, is composition of things, composition of expressions, composition of things. So it's a course we, uh, we created in uh, 2000, and it runs until uh, 2014, so it's quite a long time for a course. Um, we had uh, 700 students per year, so we, uh, I would say, we uh, infest a lot of students in scheme and teaching recursion for all these times. Uh, at the beginning, we deliver a CD-ROM to the students, uh, which contain, in fact, the course and uh, the exercise and also Dr. Scheme at the time. And Dr. Scheme was, in fact, uh, enriched by an automatized, uh, automatized, oh, I don't remember, a mechanized uh, exercise grader, uh, which allows, in fact, the students to play and to practice the exercise even if they don't have internet. Uh, in 2004, we stopped and we just put the uh, image of a CD-ROM on, on some site because most of the students have an internet connection which is quite fast, so they just uh, uh, burn their CD room themselves. And uh, we stopped in 2006 because we had at the time um, something called Mr. Scheme, I will tell about it uh, in, in some moments, uh, which is a JavaScript implementation of Scheme, so we can run it in their browser. Uh, in 2014, I, I uh, created the first MOOC on programmation recursive, recursive programmation, and uh, uh, one week ago, in 2015, uh, the second edition of this MOOC uh, was finished. And I will tell you about the uh, experiments we did in these two MOOCs. So, what is a MOOC? So, I guess that you are all familiar with MOOCs, uh, with this uh, new uh, term. And uh, it's a massive open online course. But for me, if you want to know what is a MOOC, uh, here is my definition. So, first, it's uh, distant learning. So do you, you just put course, exercise, material on some site, and people just look at them, uh, look at the videos, uh, try to practice the exercise, and so on. So this is quite a, 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 um, an old thing than that, uh, distant learning, because uh, 50 years ago with television, we already have distant learning. Uh, the interesting uh, fact with MOOCs are the three other points. First, there is a social network which is associated, that is, a forum where the students, the teachers, can interact uh, among themselves. Second, uh, there is this notion of continuous evaluation. That is, whenever you teach something, you want to be sure that this thing has been understood. And uh, this is something new. Uh, we had in Amphitheater a course of one hour, one hour and a half. And uh, we just checked six months after that 
there is an examination, and we want to be sure that they understand something from all these courses. Now, you just give some information, and you want to check uh, right after whether they understood the information or not. And the, uh, the, the other point, the last point, which is a technical point, but a very difficult one, is that it must be scalable from one student to uh, hundreds of thousands of students. And this means, in fact, a, a lot of things technically. And if you do it by computers, then you get a number of data on what the students are looking, what they are trying, etc., etc., what they are uh, exchanging in the forum. You get many, many data that you can exploit. So here is the uh, programmationrecursive.net in French. Okay. <coughs> Ah, SUC is a small open online course, because you will see that I have only uh, a few hundred students in my MOOC, so it's not very massive. But nevertheless, we, we learn a lot on this, uh, with this SUC. Um, so currently, we have uh, 60 videos, uh, five quiz, one hundred exercise, one textbook, and all of this is free. Um, we have a Google Plus page to announce the, uh, the, the new material that is published on the site. Uh, there is a Google group. Uh, there is many things from Google because it's free and you, have, you don't have to pay for that. Uh, you, you must be enrolled if you want to interact in the forum or to practice the exercise with uh, automatized grading. And the, the resources are still online today, so if you want uh, to, to look at them, you can. Uh, provided you, you know a little French, of course. So, uh, some remarks. Uh, we had plenty of material for that course, so it was easy to create this new version uh, of, uh, of a MOOC. Uh, the, one of the main difficulties is sequencing, because uh, all the studies on MOOC say that a video should not be uh, longer than seven to eight minutes. So this completely forbids the notion of a course of one hour and a half on video. Okay, so you must split your discourse into small chunks of five, six, seven minutes at long. And then, after all these, uh, these little chunks, you must devise how I can assess that the things I have, uh, I have uh, taught in that uh, sequence of six to seven minutes are really understood by the student. So you know that in programming, you have this uh, notion of test-driven programming. But now, with the MOOC, we are now on, a, uh, I would say, assessment-driven education. That is, you must think first, how I can check whether they understood the thing I want to uh, videotape. And then, if you have the right way to assess that, you can say, well, now I can turn to the video uh, studio and tell what I want to say. Uh, it's very difficult, and it's uh, quite new, I would say, for, for a professor. Uh, videos uh, can be done in front of a student in, in an amphitheater, and then you have a tremendous work by erasing the noises from the students, the evacuation, and so on and so on. And uh, you can also do it in front of a, of a green uh, uh, screen. Uh, with, without any student before you. So you don't have any feedback from the students. When you are in an amphitheater, you say things once, twice, and if you get still a uh, uh, look which are puzzled, then you can, you can ask the things a third time, okay, because you have this feedback. If you are on the, uh, before a green screen, you just say things once, because if they want to re-hear what you say, they just backwards the, uh, the videotape uh, to the, the point where they want to hear again to understand. And so it happens that uh, the videos are much, much compact than the, uh, I would say, a video taken in, in an amphitheater. So uh, for instance, if you look, there are seven hours of video, okay? But if you take all the course, there is something like 12 or 13 hours of course. So we are much more compact in videos. But of course, you must be, uh, I would say, uh, comfortable by uh, teaching your course in front of a camera and uh, maybe two, camera, two cameramen. Uh, editing a video is, is really painful. Uh, I, I did once to remove uh, inferior to uh, inferior or equal because I was wrong in one slide. 
And it's a real pain. It took me one hour to understand how to use the, uh, the software for doing that. Then uh, to uh, insert a, a small white uh, square in, uh, on top of the, of the thing, and then insert, inserting some other things. I don't remember exactly. So it's really painful. It's a, it's, it's a job, a full-time job. So uh, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, and the, the last question is, that, but what is the profit for authors? And uh, the main, uh, I would say, the main profit is uh, enriching his whole ego. <laughs> so let me give some figures of this uh, souk, of this uh, small open online course. Um, so here is the taxonomy of the, I would say, the learners. Um, these are the numbers of the first edition, and the number of the second edition are there, but the ratio are, are quite the same. Well, 500 were the number of enrolled people. So they just have to click and say, well, I want to be enrolled. So it's, it's very painless for students to say, well, I'm interested, and they click on that. Now, if you look at the real time, that is, people that look at some video or try some exercise, it's only one-fifth, okay, 100. So there is an attrition rate which is quite enormous. If you look at the uh, people that interact on the forum, you have a 1 uh, to uh, 6 or 1 to 7 uh, ratio still. Because uh, most people, in fact, well, I would say, look at the forum, uh, but the number of people that interact really, that post things in the forum, is quite uh, a few. And uh, here are the lower rate, that is the, the number of people that succeed the exercise at the end of the examination or the certification, whatever. Uh, and you have a little more than the number of uh, uh, social, I would say, interactors. And uh, for the second edition, we are quite the same. We, 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 we start from a, 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 a lower number, but uh, we still have the same kind of uh, thing. So, you have to be uh, comfortable with the idea that most of the people that say they are interested are not, in fact, interested. Uh, here are some uh, things like uh, uh, we have the number of videos which are seen, but we, we have a cutoff at five. So you appear in the drawing if, only if you have seen more than five videos. And there were something like 70 videos. And here is the, uh, the number of uh, exercise with uh, grading automatized, uh, uh, so, sorry, with automatized grading, uh, which are done by the students. So here we have the perfect student. We had one. He looked at all the videos and did all the exercise. Perfect. He, he, he gets the examination at the end, of course. Uh, in some MOOCs, there are people that look at the videos but did no exercise at all. They just want to know a little uh, what, what, what is the video is talking about. And we have none here. We have a number of people that just look at some, I would say, 10 to 15 uh, videos, but uh, did not practice. So they are just interested in saying, I want to know uh, the topic uh, of, this, uh, of this course, but I don't want to, 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 to write code. And uh, we have, I would say, the, uh, a bunch of people that look at half of the videos, you see, and, uh, but succeed the exercise and nearly all the exercise. So uh, there are two solutions, or they are good students which uh, understand things at the first time and they don't need all the videos, or they already know scheme at the, at the first time because they were teachers. We have a number of teachers in the students and uh, they know the step, so they just, uh, uh, practice the exercise and they don't need much videos to understand what happens in this uh, MOOC. Here is the, uh, uh, the number of exercise uh, seen, that is, people ask for the stem of the exercise, and the number of times they try to solve the exercise. So here is the uh, one, one to one uh, line. Um, here we have a a note point where a student look at all the stems but did only uh, 20 exercise or something like that. And uh, most of the people, in fact, are above that line. That is, whenever they look at the stem, they try to solve the exercise, okay? And uh, we have a perfect student somewhere. I don't remember exactly. But you see also that most of the people are just above the line. That is, 
we don't have many students that try 200 times to solve 55 stu uh, exercise. That is, uh, we have some odd points here where um, we have an old lady uh, that, uh, where, that was uh, very long to solve problems. And uh, it's probably this point which is there. Um, OK. Some, uh, some lessons. Uh, I use a number of sites which are hosted by Google. And the way you can extract information from these sites uh, differs from the site. So for instance, in YouTube, you cannot get the Apache log. So you, you get only statistics, uh, global statistics. But on Google App Engine, you get the Apache logs. On your own site, you get the Apache log. But you have to take care of uh, uh, the time zone, for instance, which are not, which are not the same for, from uh, machine to machine. You have to take care of the IP numbers. Uh, because you have, uh, for instance, uh, 25 students using the same proxy. Uh, you have um, uh, identification on Google site, which is not the same on your, your own site. And then you have to reconcile all these things. And it's, uh, it's, it's really a mess, and you can spend days and days to uh, clean up all this uh, information. Uh, so the, the joins from these different uh, logs we have from uh, different sites is, is very expensive to do. And it takes days, as I said, to uh, have, uh, I would say, a normalized view of what happens from site to site with the same people. Uh, and then, with all this data, you can ask, but what I want to compute exactly? And uh, there is a notion of perseverance, uh, which was introduced by some Canadian guys, uh, that means, uh, that tries to, to make a taxonomy of learners, uh, the one which are I would say uh, browsers mainly, that is, just look at the video but do no exercise at all. They are the, uh, I would say, uh, obstinate. Uh, they look at all the videos and do uh, every kind of exercise they found, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, perseverance is, a, is, a, is an attempt to try to, get to um, look at the data we get in the first weeks in order to know whether they, the, the the person at the end will get the certification on that. But it's, it's very difficult and it's a, a quite moving field currently in, uh, in the MOOC community. So here is the deployment, and I, I thank Google because uh, I'm using most of them. Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, many of these sites are free to use, and uh, since I run my MOOC, uh, I would say on my own, I just want to minimize the cost of this uh, thing. Uh, so we have a Google forum, we have a Google page, a Google Plus page. Uh, the videos are hosted on YouTube, and we use something called Course Builder, which is a, a software written by Google, which runs on Google App Engine. So provided the bandwidth and the CPU of Course Builder is not so high, you don't have to pay. Um, okay. And CodeGradix is uh, the infrastructure of automatized uh, grading I have. So uh, there are a number of questions uh, whenever you choose to deploy. Uh, for instance, the choice of channels, whether uh, uh, through which you want to deliver the information. You can use a Google Plus uh, page. You can use a, a, a group. You can use mail. You can use many different uh, Twitter. You can use many different channels. And um, it's very difficult to find a single channel that satisfies all the students. And uh, if you do, uh, if you use multiple channels, then you can <coughs> say, well, you say it on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Google Plus, and it's a, it's a real pain to have the same information from three or four different channels. So I don't know the, uh, a clear solution for that. Um, there are some uh, technical considerations. What is the cost of a solution, the scalability, the simplicity, uh, the deployment, the updates? Uh, for instance, uh, on some uh, sites, you have to, up, uh, for an update, you have to upload, in fact, the whole site with all the documents. So you have to upload something like uh, 50 gigabytes of, of things because it's not possible to just say, I want to change a comma in somewhere. Uh, so you have, uh, the trace recording is very different according to the site. So you have to think to all these things. It's, uh, it's something you should mine up. Uh, and of course, you have a binding with CodeGradix with the infrastructure. For instance, you want that 
whenever you enroll yourself on some site and say, I want to follow this MOOC, to attend this MOOC, then you have to create the, the, uh, the right account on CodeGradix, and you want this to be automatic. You don't want the people to be uh, to, to enroll on one site and another one and a third one. You just want one enrollment uh, at all. So here is the uh, CodeGradix uh, infrastructure. So there is a front end uh, with which the learners interact. And first, we, uh, the front end interacts with a control authentication uh, server to know whether the, people, uh, the person has the right to interact with the whole infrastructure or not. Then, uh, the front end interacts with the exercise server in order to get the stem of the exercise. Then, uh, the, the learner works on the exercise, he look, he read the stem, he try to a solution, and then he have to send the solution to an acquisition server, which is only a queue of uh, of jobs. We have something at the uh, at the middle, which is a marking driver, which in fact looks at the queues, and whenever it find a job, then he send it to uh, some uh, virtual machine, which is inside the marking driver, in order to um, to to grade uh, this job. And whenever it has finished, it produces a grading report, which is stored on the storage server. And this is precisely where the front end is looking uh, for the grading report. So this architecture, in fact, allows the marking driver to be unreachable from, our, from the network. Uh, this is a marking driver that gets the exercise and all the scripts which are, re uh, which are uh, needed to mark the, uh, the, the, the job. It uh, polls the acquisition server, it, polls, it uh, puts uh, the grading report on the storage server, so it's quite immune, I would say, to, to, to internet. And uh, uh, the, the, the job are run in a virtual machine, which is also inside the marking driver, so uh, I would say confined from internet, in order for the students not to interact directly with these uh, sensible things. Uh, we have uh, REST protocols everywhere and XML JSON documents. So uh, the one mission of a front end is to convert this XML JSON into HTML for the learner. So you can, in this translation, insert the, le the logo of a university or uh, the colors of, uh, of a, the, the cascading style sheet, etc., etc. So we have this, uh, this uh, IDE for, for the MOOC. Uh, which is a uh, Mr. Scheme, which is an interpreter of our dialect written in, in JavaScript. So this looks like that. So you have a, a window here where you can just type your code and you click on that button and you get uh, <coughs> the answer of your code. If there is something wrong, it, appear, it appears in red and it explains you why it's wrong. So this is uh, the, uh, uh, the ID. Um, there is another button which is uh, so the, uh, this, uh, this one, which say, well, now that I have tested my program locally with the uh, uh, integrated doc the Mr. Scheme environment, I can send it to the infrastructure in order to get the grading report. And the grading report looks like that. So it's a very verbose thing that mentions every step of the grading scripts. Uh, let me show you. So the grading report is very verbose. We, we find in some experiments near 2002 and 2003 that the longest, uh, sorry, the longer the grading report is and the less questions from students you have. Okay, so you explain. I take your code. Uh, this is your code. So to, to mention that you get the right code and not uh, some other version. Then you say, well, I compile it. It works. Uh, this is the test. Uh, you show the test. I put it in front of your, uh, of your program, and this is the result you get, uh, your program uh, produces. Now I take the same test, I test it with my program, it gives that thing. So I normalize the, the two results, for instance, I remove the white space or things like that, and then I compare, and I say, well, there are three characters of five lines of difference, so you get this, uh, this, uh, this mark. So you have to be very, very, I would say, verbose. And as I said, the more verbose you are, and the less question you have. You have only questions like uh, from uh, very good students that say, well, at the uh, um, 
124th uh, test, you mentioned this, and this is not conformant to the specification you give in the step. And then you say, well, you are good. You change your stem, you recompute all the copies of your students, and you get the new marks. So it's very interesting. Is all test based? The quality, the grading is based on tests? Yes, on unit tests. So yeah. you, you don't look at, uh, you don't analyze the source code? No, currently uh, for this MOOC, I don't look at it. I will mention that it's a, it's a work in progress for over the next uh, years. So uh, here you have a, a num another, another graph. Uh, the black line is the number of new exercises I uh, introduce every week. And you see that the number of, uh, of successes is in fact uh, uh, quite, uh, I would say, uh, has the same shape as the number of exercises. Uh, here is a, is a week of holidays in France, so I suspect that uh, there is a, uh, an impact. Uh, there are two things which are interesting. You see that the number of uh, 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 the, the, the red uh, area here, uh, the, uh, the, the red area corresponds to failure to solve an exercise. Here you solve it entirely. Here you get at least 80% uh, of, the, of the final mark, of the total mark. And here you fail. And you see that, the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the number of failure is quite diminishing, in fact. Uh, this means, in fact, that people get used to the fact that their, uh, uh, their functions are graded, and they understand more that they have to test first in Mr. Scheme in their browser before sending uh, immediately uh, their solution to, to the grader. Yes? So is, is that the case, or is it that, that, that students drop? No, 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 no. Uh, here we just take the, uh, the solution we get, so there are active students. Yes, but I mean, ah. uh, it might be that the first weeks there are lots of students who would realize, that, oh, this is hopeless, I'm already, always getting red stuff. So I'm just wondering if you have data on, on your, yeah, I have your data. analysis. Or... Yeah, um, I would say that uh, after week three or four, uh, we get the same, I would say, kernel of students which did all the work. So we have many drop-off at the uh, very beginning of the MOOC. <coughs> okay. It's so not, then, not, not the case that more bad students drop out. Yes. Where bad students, Yes, uh, that, that's true also. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing also which is interesting is the, uh, the, the uh, orange uh, uh, area that corresponds to someone who gets at least 80% of the, of the final mark. So I consider it as a near success. And most of the time, they have the algorithm that is the function that we ask for right, but their test is not, is not completely sufficient. And uh, some people say, well, I have a, a good algorithm, so I, 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 I give up. Okay? And others want to have the, uh, uh, the total mark, and they try to, to have all the unit tests for their functions working and complete. I, I will get into uh, this thing. Uh, here, just a, a small word on scaling. I mentioned that everything w w uh, from the learner pass through the uh, front end. But in fact, now, to, to get a, a, a more easy scaling, uh, the learner, in fact, interacts directly with the uh, exercise server, the uh, acquisition server, the storage server. So everything is done now in the browser of a learner rather than in, uh, in the uh, uh, front end here. And uh, we have four uh, marking drivers running in concurrently. So this allows, in fact, to, tr to handle something like uh, 30 to 50 uh, concurrent uh, students at a time. But uh, since I, uh, in my logs, I mentioned, I uh, realized that I had only at most two students r uh, using the, the, uh, the platform at the same time. In fact, whenever a student posts uh, a, a, a solution, all the five, uh, all the four, sorry, marking drivers get uh, hungry and get the file, so it gets uh, uh, it get uh, graded four times, and uh, the, the database in fact holds that uh, they, uh, they, they, they they gave the same mark for the same term. But, yeah, it allows, in fact, to test things. Uh, yeah, I'm skipping this fact. So how to make this uh, mechanized grading? So an exercise is a targeted uh, thing that contains a stem, that contains some grading script, 
and things I call pseudo jobs, which are, uh, I would say, uh, solutions from uh, putative uh, students, but in uh, in the um, uh, in the XML descriptor, we know which mark they should get. So it's a way of uh, uh, testing the non-regression. That is, when you install the exercise on a machine, you can check that all the pseudo copies of the pseudo jobs get the mark we are expecting. Uh, this allows, for instance, um, to avoid uh, an exercise that expects some uh, weird tool to be uh, present in the virtual machine, and the tool is not there, and so you you cannot get the uh, total mark. Uh, the grading scripts are confined in time and output, so uh, you can say that uh, this script should run for at least three seconds, and it it should it must output only 10k of, uh, of characters. Uh, we use uh, virtual machines, uh, Linux containers, and things like that to confine the the, the copy because we have. Uh, some students that uh, write very bad program that loops or uh, that uh, wait forever for whatever. Uh, but uh, since we are also uh, running the grading scripts which are written by the teacher, sometimes the grading scripts are also false and they loop or they expect something that doesn't happen. So we have to confine, uh, uh, these scripts are confining the student's code and the infrastructure is confining the grading script from the teacher. Okay, so it's a double confinement in order to, to have something that runs. Uh, we have libraries for all these uh, languages, but for the MOOC we only use a scheme here. Um, so, how it works uh, really? The learner's code is a solution and some unit test, and uh, we want to produce the grading report. And we compare, in fact, the uh, solution of a learner with the solution of a teacher. So the solution of a teacher is taken into a framework that uh, runs it, confines it, and so on, and compare with the learner's code. And at the end, it produces a grading report that the student can read. So here is a, uh, yeah, the uh, grading report that say, I want to read your file, I analyze the syntax of your file, I evaluate your file. Oh, you define the cube function. Uh, then uh, your cube function is uh, passing all your two unit tests and so on and so on. So you say everything you do, and this makes the students comfortable that his code has been taken uh, well into account. Okay, and at the end you have something in red that say, oh, your function cube is failing my uh, my second test, and here is the test cube of two. And you don't give the answer, of course, because otherwise the student will uh, enter the, uh, the answer of cube two in his own uh, unit test. So he has to think out what should be the solution of cube two and then write another algorithm for that and so on and so on. Okay, here you see that I cheat a little because I write two tests which are the same. Cube of one is one, cube of one is one. Okay, so this is the usual kind of cheat you, you see from students. Okay, so how it works exactly. So here is the code of a student. So he defined a function, the function which was asked by the stem, and here you have a unit test. Verify foo, foo of that, give something itself. So I call this function the uh, function of a student and the verification of a student. So these are the phase of the verification. First, we want to check the coherency. So we check that the verification of a student work well with the function of students. If it is not the case, we say reject. We don't want to say to, um, sorry, we, we don't want to, to grade something that is not going right. Then we check that the student is uh, really answering the stem, that is the appropriateness. So we take the function of a teacher and we pass it through the verification of a student. Okay? Um, in fact, we discovered last year at the first edition of a MOOC uh, that it's not exactly correct, and I will explain in the next slide. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the, weight of a, of a mark, the, the weight of a mark for that uh, phase is zero, so uh, whenever it fails or not, it's zero. We, we just check. I will explain. So grading, you just take the function of a student and you pass it through the verification of a teacher. And if there are 10 tests and you succeed five, you get five on 10. Uh, and then we wanted to be able to check 
the uh, unit test. And uh, so we, we, we fought uh, a lot of time last year to, to, to do that. And this is what we do. We run the uh, function of a student in his own test, and we run the function of a student in the test, in the test of the teacher. And we analyze the coverture of code of the function, which is animated by the test of a student with respect to the test of, a of the teacher. And if the coverture is the same, then we expect the test of a, of a teacher to be quite good. So we say, well, you do at least uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as good as the, as the teacher. So that's good. But if you don't have uh, this uh, same coverture, then you get only a fraction of the points. So let me return to sorry. Let me return to this uh, phase, uh, which is the appropriateness. Why this, which, which uh, look like a very, uh, I would say, very familiar, uh, might in fact not work. So suppose, for instance, that we ask here for a function on natural numbers. And the students, in fact, answer with a function that takes integers. And he had a test here that foo of minus 1 is equal to whatever it computes. So clearly, it is, the, the, the function of a student is out of scope, is exceeding the step. So it's quite normal that the test of a teacher fails on that, because we are out of scope. So. Uh, the only difference between the code of a student and the code of a teacher is that the code of a teacher should be very cautious and it should check uh, the hypotheses which are expected to be true on the code of a student. So if we say that the function of a student should take natural numbers, then we must test in the author's function that we have a natural number, not something else. Okay? So this is a, the, the slight difference between the code of a student and the code of the teacher. Would, would type checking solve this problem? Uh, oh, on integer and uh, natural oh, numbers? Then, the, then it would solve it, right? Uh, if you are able, in fact, to have integer. natural number and yeah, integer. Yeah, yeah, it can. OK, uh, okay so uh, one other thing is that you have to clearly separate the learners and the author's namespace, because you are here running things which belong to the teacher and um, uh, belong to the student, and you don't, and you use the same names, of course. Uh, you are the, the function of a teacher is called foo, and the tests here are also are also named very high foo. So you must take care of that. So let me uh, focus on that on that because it's interesting. Uh, so you creating so if a learner's code is define a function foo that use a, a helper a function which is called bar. And you, if you verify foo, the foo of a student is using bar of a student, of course. Now, if you verify foo, but you need a helper function for the verification, then uh, verify foo of a student is using the x of a student, of course. Now we go to the learner code. The foo, bar, the foo function of a teacher is using foo bar of a teacher. OK, that's still good. But when you take this function foo and you put it in the verification of a student, you still use foo bar. You don't use the foo bar of a student. Okay? And then if you use a helper function in the verification of a teacher, uh, this uh, verification of the function of a student you put here should use the bullify function of the teacher and not the bullify function of a student. So the solution is, in fact, that you have to close all the function in the global environment of a, of a student and close all the function of a teacher in the global environment of a teacher. And this is something that is uh, uh, reasonable, but uh, many languages have only one name face of the global name face. But here you need two. So you have to devise a way to, to do it. So currently, in our interpreters, there are two names, two separated namespaces uh, made by learners. OK. Uh, yeah, and uh, our interpreters, in fact, are not evaluating programs for their values. They are evaluating programs and, and uh, yields some uh, structured things, say, uh, an association list that say, the function foo is defined by this closure, 
and, the, and has this number of verification and so on and so on. And then you get this from the student, you get this from the teacher, and then you just have to perform all the uh, cross, I would say, uh, check from the two spaces. Okay, writing an exercise is very uh, simple. You have a number of things which are statically known. They are, this is the framework of the uh, comparison thing, so you don't have to, to, uh, to look at them. We have the uh, uh, pseudocopies here, so we have three pseudocopies, uh, the null one, the half one, and the perfect one. The null one doesn't contain anything, okay? And you are expecting that if you don't give any answer, uh, sorry, any solution to the grader, you get a zero, okay? Just a, a simple test, but sometimes uh, young, I would say, uh, young exercise writers uh, are giving, are give, giving uh, some marks, even for an empty copy. So it's something you should avoid. It's not very uh, good. Uh, we have a perfect copy, which, get, which should get, of course, 100% uh, of the final mark. And then you have this uh, imperfect copy half here. And uh, the reason of that is uh, since you are comparing the student's code to the teacher code, uh, imagine that the teacher's code is, is wrong, is false, it errs. Okay? Then when you install the exercise, you compare the perfect code of a student with the perfect code of a student, so we, if they both errors, that's good. You get 100%. And at that time, the, the exercise is totally false, and nobody can get out in a, another note over than zero. So the reason, uh, the raison d'être of the half copy is to get a, 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 a mark which is between zero and one. Okay, And if you get it, you, you, you are more, I would say, uh, comfortable with the idea that your exercise is working. And uh, since it's, uh, it's uh, uh, rather simple uh, as a structure, we have a form in the MOOC that allows, in fact, to define an exercise. So the, the student has just to write the stem and to write the uh, perfect solution. And uh, this is called a challenge. And uh, so students can send challenge to the other or defy the others and say, well, I've written a, an exercise so you can uh, try yourself to, so, to solve it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't get any challenge from the students. Okay, so there are some incentives. So the, uh, the scoreboard, the graphical exercise, we have a gallery that, where they can expose their code and, the, and the, uh, the drawing they get. We have some badges uh, for the uh, linear master, linear grand master, and so on, and the tree recursion uh, master. We have this notion of challenges that allows, in fact, to write an exercise and to defy the others to solve it. We have this thing we call the epsilon beta PP I will tell you uh, about in the next slide. So last year, when I, uh, I was starting the uh, first edition of a MOOC, I said, well, I will have 10 of thousand of students. Well, I did not get them, but I was expecting so. And I said, well, how I can help students that uh, did not solve an exercise? So I came to this idea of uh, epsilon beta PV, that it, if you fail to solve the exercise, I will allow you, in fact, to see one or another copy of another solution of another student, which is slightly better than yours. Okay? You get uh, 5 on 10, so I can allow you to see a copy with 6 on 10. Okay? A little better. So it might be better because the algorithm is better or the verification is better. I don't know. You have to, re to, to read this code, a uh, uh, very good exercise, and to understand why you got a, a mark which is higher than yours. Okay? Uh, so, uh, so this is the, the epsilon beta peeping. So you just uh, allow the uh, students to peep another copy. Uh, we, we had also, uh, at the end of the first edition of a MOOC, Another complaint from students that say, well, I solve the exercise, but I'm not sure I get the solution, the good solution, the teacher's solution. And uh, I use the same uh, mechanism, in fact, to say, well, if you, get, uh, if you solve the exercise, I can show you other copies that solve the exercise. Uh, the only thing I will ask you is to, uh, to click on a button that say, the copy I showed you is better than yours or not. So it's a way, in fact, of uh, using the power of a crowd to rank or to select the very good copies, which are indeed, I would say, elected by your students as that. 
so there are many, many, many problems with, uh, with this thing. So, uh, for instance, uh, for the students that solve the, the, the entire uh, uh, exercise, it's not very complicated, and the uh, selection will, will, at the end, select the good copies. But for the other one who fail, in fact, the exercise, how to show something which is slightly better? You can use a mark, of course. But if there are more than one solution, more than one way to, to, to solve the exercise, you want to show something which is related to the actual code of a student, not completely unrelated. And uh, this is far, far uh, this is very, very difficult, in fact, to select the appropriate copy for the appropriate student. So uh, we, we, we have this notion of salmon ladder, so we, we just try to, to help the, uh, the students to, uh, to, step, to, to jump from step to step until the, the end. Uh, but select the interesting codes to show is still an open problem. So currently, we just uh, use the mark to show something better, and we also ask uh, in a form whether this copy helps you or not. And if uh, we, we, we try to select uh, the good copies like that. But if there is more than one way to solve the exercise, I don't know how to do it for, for now. Okay, so uh, we have this instrumented interpreter, blah, blah, blah. Okay, future work. Um, clearly, currently, we have to promote more of uh, this MOOC and to sustain the interest. So uh, we have some, uh, some ideas. So first, to improve a grader, since now we have a, a database of solutions, we can just uh, data mine it to know what are the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the attempts of the students and to try to classify these attempts. Uh, we want also to measure the algorithmic complexity of the students. Uh, that is, uh, if they solve a solution which is linear in, in quadratic time, then we, we want to be able to say that. So currently, the interpreter are instrumented so we can measure how many cons, how many car, how many if uh, they go through uh, for this uh, exercise. But now I want to take uh, advantage of that and say, well, your solution is using uh, uh, n cons and, uh, or n, n squared cons, and uh, you should use only n or n log n, I don't know. So we, I'm in, uh, in, in the process of, uh, uh, I would say, estimating this uh, complexity. We have to check style, as you mentioned, and um, we can check style, I would say, in a syntactic form, whether the programs are uh, correctly indented or not. But we can also check um, uh, more, more things. And we can also check types, because we are in a small subset which is completely typable, and uh, we will uh, introduce that later. So uh, here is the, uh, uh, the end. Uh, we, some people ask for more quizzes. We, we have only five of them. Because in the first edition, most people say the, the quizzes are completely useless. So uh, I, I would say I, I did not uh, put any effort in, uh, in uh, uh, adding some more quizzes. But now for the second edition, people say we want more quizzes. So I don't. I will probably add some more. Uh, they ask for more exercise. Even, they are, even if there are uh, 100 exercises currently, they want more exercise. And uh, we want to use the crowd power to, uh, I would say, tag the good answers and select interesting uh, solutions. OK, so the real thing which is really interesting with MOOC is that you get a ton of data. And you can put this data at advantage to understand whether you should present that exercise before that one exercise. Or you can make a test, uh, uh, A, B, uh, alpha, beta test. That is, you present exercise A and B, then exercise B and A for a part of the uh, audience. And you see whether they succeed more easily in one way or the other way. You, you have now, you can entirely renew the pedagogical, I would say, uh, uh, studies, because now you have real numbers, not for this uh, small, small MOOC, MOOC. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, hundreds or, or thousands of students, you can have real experiments. Uh, the world is, is full of papers saying, I select 10 students in my, in my group, I, I practice with them a, a, an interesting course, and of course they were delighted with this course. But if you are a student and you have some, uh, I would say, MIFA theory, you say that if a teacher is doing an experiment, you, you, you should go with it. 
you should go with him because the experiment can only be successful. Okay, he cannot say, well, the experiment is bad, so I refuse the mark at the end for all the students that follow uh, this, uh, this attempt. You cannot do that. So all pedagogical experiments are successful. It's a, it's a fear. Now, you have plenty of data, and you can really check on thousands of students with uh, uh, statistically uh, correct figures whether it works or not. And this is, I would say, the uh, main interest of MOOCs currently. Okay, I'm finished. Okay.